Um, uh, I wanted to thank everyone uh, for participating in this webinar. Uh, it's very exciting. Wikipedia this year is celebrating 20 years of humans creating free knowledge, and our partnership with UN Human Rights has been a really important part of this uh, 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 partnership celebrating the humanity of uh, 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 us all who create knowledge. Um, it's really exciting here to have a conversation about uh, the right to a healthy environment as part of our Wiki for Human Rights campaign. Because uh, as you all know, we all have a right to a healthy environment. Um, and this is a really important part of uh, uh, all of us living healthy uh, and well within the global community. Um, uh, this is a story about not only us uh, now, but in future generations. Um, uh, and can uh, Indira is raising her hand. Can we make sure she's added to interpretation for Russian? I think that's Michelle, right? I can't do yeah. it myself. Um, what is the name of, of, sorry. of your partner? Uh, it's Indira. I'll work. This is an experiment uh, to do live interpretation. Yeah. And there's also Pratik, cannot see the sign for interpretation. Interesting. Um, if you do not have the right version of Zoom or the most up to date version of Zoom, you may not see it. Cool. Um, yeah, you, you might find it under more. Cool. Um, so, excellent. I hope the interpretation works. Sorry for any technical difficulties. Um, Hi, um, yes, I'm, uh, so I, I want to, I, did, I didn't say. Hi, I'm Alex Stenson. Um, I'm a strategist at the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, I, sorry, uh, I am the coordinator for uh, the Wiki and, uh, for Human Rights campaign. Uh, and we uh, are so excited to have you here. Um, we are, sorry, presenter view. Um, the, the campaign is a really important part of our partnership with UN Human Rights. Uh, and we are really excited about this because it's part of us celebrating 20 years human. Um, as I mentioned, we all have a right to a healthy environment. Uh, and I wanted to invite uh, our partner, Monica Iyer from UN Human Rights uh, to speak to uh, the campaign. And then we will introduce you to our speakers. Hi, Monica. Hello, all. Uh, thank you, Alex, for, introdu for introducing this event and for all the collaboration leading up to it. And thanks to everyone for bearing with us with the technical difficulties. Uh, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights is the leading UN entity on human rights. And we have a mandate to promote and protect human rights all over the world and to empower people to realize their rights. And this partnership with Wikipedia is relatively new to our office. But in a short time, we've seen important advances in making human rights information available on Wikipedia, especially with regard to gender equality and the rights of women and girls. We're very excited to be doing our first campaign centering on the intersection of human rights and the environment, and to have also our partners at the UN Environment Program joining us and very excited to have the great speakers we have with us today to kick this off. Uh, freedom of access to a broad range of accurate information is key to the realization of all human rights. And this is particularly true in the context of the human rights harms caused by environmental degradation. We live in a time when the human right to a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment is under threat all over the world. 
and when climate change, pollution, and biodiversity and habitat loss are already causing enormous impacts on the rights to life, to health, to food and water and sanitation, and so many others. The global community is taking action on these crises, but there are risks that that action isn't being taken fast enough and that it isn't ambitious enough and that it isn't being guided and led by the people who are the most affected. And that's what makes having widely accessible, accurate information so important because knowledge empowers people to claim their rights and to participate in environmental action. It enables the work and the protection of environmental human rights defenders, many of them women and girls, who strive at great personal risk to protect their lands, waters, homes, and communities from environmental harms. And so we're delighted that you're all joining us today and that hopefully many others will join us over the coming weeks to help contribute to a broad global knowledge base on the environment and human rights and to help empower everyone everywhere to stand up for people in the planet. Thank you. Thank you. And again, uh, apologies for technical difficulties and a little bit of disorientation. Um, but we, we're going to start the, the main part of our conversation. Thank you, Monica, for introducing the importance of this. And um, from the Wikimedia Foundation, we find this a very important, compelling topic. Um, we, we are going to go through a conversation uh, with a group of experts. Uh, David Boyd is the Special Rapporteur for Right to Healthy or, uh, Environment and Human Rights. Um, we have an organizer from our Wikimedia community, Joy uh, Agyapong, um, who is a Wikimedia organizer in Ghana. Um, we have a, a, two youth champions of the Eskazu Agreement, which is an incoming human rights and the environment uh, 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 treaty that is going to be very important for Latin America. And then a brief introduction to what you can do as part of the Wiki for Human Rights campaign. Um, if you have questions, I have a colleague uh, in the, um, uh, the chat, Deb Tankersley, who will be collecting them in the either the main Zoom settings or the Q&A uh, question, and we will queue that up for action. Um, but I wanted to hand over to David, uh, who will be talking a little bit about what it means to have a right to a healthy environment. Super. Thanks very much, Alex. And uh, hello, everyone from Canada, where it's a beautiful spring day. The sun is shining, the birds are singing, the flowers are blooming, the whales are migrating. And I think this is a reminder that we live on this beautiful blue-green planet, the only planet in the universe that is known to support life. And yet, we as humans are contributing to these global environmental crises that Monica mentioned, the climate emergency, the crash and collapse of biological diversity, pollution that's causing 10 million premature deaths every year, as well as this surge in emerging infectious diseases of zoonotic origin, most exemplified by this terrible COVID-19 pandemic that we find ourselves in. And so what we have is we have the world's leading scientists, indigenous people and youth, calling for rapid, systemic, and transformative changes. And that's a, that's a big challenge. But we know that human rights in the past has been up to that challenge. The history of human rights is that it can be a catalyst for systemic and transformative changes. Think about the way that human rights were used to bring about the end of slavery, for example, or the end of apartheid in South Africa. Think about the way human rights have been used by indigenous peoples, LGBTQ plus persons, people with disabilities, and, and more to, to achieve really systemic changes. Now, human rights are not a magic wand that can instantly change everything for the better, but they do have that transformative capacity. And so it's exciting to learn that there is a relatively new human right called the right to live in a healthy environment, which was first talked about in 1972 at the first Earth Summit in Stockholm, Sweden. And since that time has really spread to all corners of the world so that today, over 80% of the world's countries, 156 out of 193 UN countries, actually recognize this right, either in their constitutions, in their environmental laws, or in regional human rights treaties that they've signed that include this right. And I know that my friends Nikki and Sebastian will be talking about the really exciting new agreement from Latin America and the Caribbean in a few minutes, the Escazú Agreement. But people ask, what does it actually mean to have a right to a healthy environment? 
And it, there's actually two components of it. There's substantive components and procedural components. On the substantive side, it means clean air to breathe, safe and sufficient water, healthy and sustainably produced food, a safe climate, healthy and flourishing biodiversity and ecosystems, and non-toxic environments where people can live, work, study, and play. And then on the procedural side, that's like a toolbox of things that we can use to achieve those substantive elements. So access to information, which is where Wikipedia can play such a vital role, but also public participation in environmental decision-making, access to justice and effective remedies. And so this right to a healthy environment has tremendous potential, but there's problems with respect to its implementation because it's not as widely known as it should be. Um, but we do know in countries where this right is recognized in law, the right to a healthy environment serves as a catalyst for positive changes, stronger environmental laws and policies, improved implementation and enforcement of those laws and policies, increased availability of information and public participation, and most importantly, improvements on the ground, changes to people's lives. So countries that recognize the right to a healthy environment have reduced air pollution more quickly. They have reduced greenhouse gas emissions more quickly. They have ensured access to safe drinking water at a higher proportion of their populations. So that's really the key, is that this can change people's lives. And I want to give you two countries where this has proven to be the case, Costa Rica and France. Costa Rica is a small Latin American country with an absolutely amazing environmental record. They put the right to a healthy environment into their constitution in 1994, and since that time, have really transformed the country into a global environmental leader. They've gone from a situation of serious deforestation, where forest cover in Costa Rica was down to about 25% in the late 1980s. They've now reforested great swaths of that country in tropical rainforest and are now at over 50% forest cover. They've protected almost 30% of the country in national parks. They generate over 98% of their electricity from clean renewable sources like solar, wind, geothermal, and hydro. And Costa Rica has also got a really in innovative program where they place the tax on carbon emissions and they use that revenue to pay farmers and indigenous peoples to protect their lands and restore those lands. So Costa Rica has done great things in implementing the right to a healthy environment. France uh, has added the right to a healthy environment to its constitution more recently in 2004, but since that time has also taken great strides. France was the first country in the world to pass a law that bans fracking, this dangerous way of extracting oil and gas that has devastating environmental consequences. France was the first country in the world to ban all uses of neonicotinoid pesticides, these pesticides that cause the death of bees and other pollinators. And France is also the first wealthy country to prohibit the export of pesticides that are not allowed to be used in France to other countries in the global south. Not coincidentally, France and Costa Rica are also the co-chairs of something called the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People, which has a really ambitious goal of protecting 30% of the Earth's lands and waters by 2030, something which, if it's done from a rights-based approach in partnership with Indigenous peoples and local communities, could have huge benefits for all of us. And so in terms of going forward, we need to do two things. Alex mentioned that everyone has the right to a healthy environment. That's true from a moral perspective, but from a legal perspective, there are still 37 countries where the right is not recognized. And the United Nations has never passed a resolution recognizing this right. So that's two areas where we need to improve and make progress. And finally, we need to implement this right. Even in countries that do recognize it, there's more work to be done. So I hope that this wiki uh, campaign on human rights and the environment will contribute to accelerating progress towards a greener, cleaner, healthier planet for all of us, our children, our grandchildren, and all of the amazing species that we share this planet with. Thanks very much, and I look forward to the rest of today's event. Thank you, David. Uh, and it's so great to have you here. And yes, we really hope Wikimedia is a uh, uh, the center of uh, uh, kind of communication.
communication for many different topics, um, as we've seen in the light of the COVID pandemic and, and some research I've been doing with my colleagues uh, about climate change topics in particular, Wikipedia is often one of the first places where we learn about something that is challenging the world. Um, I, I recently did a little bit of research data um, uh, into climate change specific content within the, the Wikimedia uh, movement. Um, and about 300 million people uh, 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 visits to our climate content happens on Wikipedia. Um, and you know, when people are looking for content on Wikipedia, they're often searching for it for the first time. They're asking a question of Google. They're asking a question when policymakers make a decision. Um, and they're, they're trying to decide like, what should I know about this topic? How should I know about it? Um, one thing that's very important to Wikimedia communities is organizing from a local perspective. Um, and so we have invited Joy uh, from our uh, community in Ghana, who is a member of our uh, organization, Open Foundation West Africa, um, who will be talking a little bit of why it's so important to uh, have a um, local communities, Wikimedia communities, editing about these topics. Um, and uh, Joy, can you join us? Hi, Alex. Hello, everyone. Um, are we able to turn on Joy's video? Hello. Hi, Joy, we can hear you. Joy? Yes. Hi. Um, yes, I, I can hear you now. Excellent. Um, so uh, can you speak a little bit of to why it's so important for Wikimedia communities to edit about topics like climate? Okay. Yeah, thank you. So um, yeah, it's just important because um, like we do as Wikimedians, um, there are diverse topics or diverse issues that are out there that has not been covered yet on Wikipedia. So if an issue of um, climate information is not readily accessible for um, uh, users, institutions or bodies, it makes them crippled to know exactly how to tackle these issues and it makes it difficult for them to collate or put it in the data together as to which areas needs much emphasis or focus on. So I would encourage all local community members to take up this call and go online to you know make more research because there are lots of um, institutions or lots of um, um, degraded um, areas that has not been attended to because that information is not represented online. Um, and Joy, uh, can you explain a little bit what your communities have been doing in Ghana uh, for uh, addressing these gaps? Okay, so um, with regards to that, um, what we had have done in the past is to look out for these institutions that are um, interested to address the topic at hand. So if it's uh, climate, related topic, we try to um, partner with them, collaborate with them, and ensure that their um, staff or the, their network that they have around them are introduced to the open movement, where if they have any um, information that has not been shared online, we try as much as possible to collaborate with the uh, media institutions to help project it online so that we can have that coverage on Wikipedia. Aside that, we also go on the field to visit these sites which have not um, been photographed yet. For example, um, if there's an article on a certain landscape or um, certain um, um, degraded site that has nobody knows about it because nobody um, know about knows about its existence, we go out there to take photos of it and make meaning to the existing article that is already there. But then if um, the article is also not created, 
we try as much as possible to conduct the research that we can with anybody who is available in the um, community or region to help us project it online. Thank you, Joy. The, the work of our local Wikimedia communities are so powerful, especially for topics like human rights and, and climate and environmental issues. Um, I really invite you to uh, uh, um, ask questions about how Wikimedia communities can do that during the Q&A session. Um, next, I wanted to introduce uh, two youth champions of the Escazú Agreement. Um, they will be speaking in Spanish through our Spanish uh, to English, English to Spanish interpreter, Andy. Um, and we will give a moment uh, for uh, Andy and everyone to, uh, so uh, yes, make sure that you have switched uh, to your English interpretation if you need it or in other languages. Um, note, if you are in a language other than English or Spanish, there will be two layers of interpretation for this section. So um, we'll invite Sebastian uh, uh, to start, and then we can go from there. Thank you. Eh, voy a comenzar entonces hablando en español. Primero me gustaría saludarlos a todas y todos. Hay mucha gente reunida en esta charla. Eh, y me gustaría partir primero agradeciendo y admitiendo que es un honor para mí estar hoy día aquí compartiendo con Wikipedia, con Uno de Derechos Humanos, con Penuma, una pequeña reflexión sobre la importancia de tratados como el Acuerdo de Escazú y plataformas también como Wikipedia en el ejercicio del derecho a vivir en un medio ambiente sano. En primer lugar, me debo sumar a las afirmaciones que ya se han dicho eh, respecto a lo que significa el derecho a vivir en un medio ambiente sano y desde mi punto de vista, creo que me gustaría señalar que este es un derecho clave en la defensa y la protección de nuestro medio ambiente eh, y lo es porque no tan solo nos obliga a repensar un poco nuestra relación con el medio ambiente desde una perspectiva de cuidados y de garantías, sino que además nos permite dar pie a la afirmación de que los derechos humanos y los derechos ambientales están intrínsecamente relacionados. Y eso significa que un medio ambiente sano, eh, sin riesgo, limpio, saludable y sostenible es indispensable para el pleno disfrute de todos los derechos humanos y también en viceversa. Y esta afirmación es particularmente relevante a la hora de comprender la importancia de tratados como el Acuerdo de Escazú en el ejercicio de este derecho, porque no tan solo es un tratado que eh, se suma a otros tratados que ya consagran explícitamente este derecho, sino que además se trata de un instrumento que sirve como una herramienta clave para que las personas y las organizaciones puedan ejercer efectivamente este derecho en la práctica. El, uh, uh, can I ask Sebastian to slow down just a little bit uh, for uh, our uh, interpretation? Thank you. Uh, como decía, el acuerdo de Escazú no tan solo eh, se trata del primer acuerdo ambiental de toda América Latina y el Caribe, sino que además consiste en un tratado que tiene como objetivo poder luchar contra las injusticias y las desigualdades ambientales dándole más derechos a las personas, a las comunidades, a las organizaciones para que puedan defender su entorno. Y entre ellos un derecho que a mí parece es el más importante y no por nada es también el primer derecho que consagra el acuerdo, es el derecho a acceder a la información. Y es que el acceso a la información es esencial para poder ejercer prácticamente todos los demás derechos, eh, porque no podemos ejercer plenamente si, eh, nuestros derechos si es que no los conocemos. Y en este punto, plataformas como Wikipedia cobran una relevancia gigante. Eh, tenemos que brindarle a las personas todas las herramientas posibles para que puedan hacer valer sus derechos, lo que no implica necesariamente darles toda la información que tenemos a nuestro alcance para abrumarlos eh, y hacer textos muy largos, sino que debemos ser capaces de educar y comunicar en un lenguaje accesible. Por ejemplo, ¿cuáles son nuestros derechos? ¿Por qué son importantes? y también cómo es que podemos ejercerlos, asociándolos también no exclusivamente a su historia en cuanto a las negociaciones internacionales, por ejemplo, que lo hicieron posible, sino que también aquellas historias a veces olvidadas, un poco ocultas, de cómo grupos eh, de personas comunes y corrientes comenzaron a preocuparse por algunas situaciones, problemas cotidianos, y comenzaron también a organizarse 
para demandar acción, y que fueron finalmente ese movimiento lo que desembocó eh, en que después estos derechos se consagraran. Solo así vamos a lograr acercar estos derechos y hacer que formen parte de las personas comunes y corrientes. Pero no basta con eso, y con esto ya para ir terminando la reflexión, eh, no basta tan solo con garantizar el acceso a la información ambiental, el Acuerdo de Escazú también lo reconoce, eh, porque no podemos generar información fidedigna, de calidad, si quienes hoy día llevan a cabo la labor del reporteo, de la generación de información, están siendo víctimas de amenaza, de hostigamiento e incluso de asesinatos. Y esta es una situación que a mí en lo personal, siendo un activista joven y también estudiante de periodismo, en Latinoamérica me es muy muy preocupante, considerando que hace poco menos de tres semanas un estudiante de periodismo que se encontraba investigando los impactos de la industria minera en las comunidades locales de mi país, Chile, fue víctima de amenaza simplemente por levantar información respecto a una problemática que está vulnerando efectivamente el derecho de cientos de personas a vivir en un medio ambiente sano. Eh, y pareciera ser que lamentablemente la pandemia que hoy estamos viviendo solo obstaculiza aún más la labor de generar información y de los comunicadores también de comunicar lo que está pasando en nuestro entorno. Y este último tiempo también he podido observar incluso eh, cómo ciertas autoridades de gobierno ya están perdiendo un poco la credibilidad de las personas e incluso se pasan al otro lado eh, y se ha visto casos de personas incluso como las más altas autoridades como el presidente de la república por ejemplo que ha intentado interferir en la agenda pública y evitar que se publique información que lo pueda perjudicar lo que nos habla también de un importante precedente a considerar respecto del estado de las cosas en materia de acceso a la información y libertad de expresión y libertad de prensa y ahora sí que sí, para no extenderme más eh, me gustaría terminar con una muy pequeña conclusión, que es eh, dar la idea de que en este tiempo difícil en el que nos encontramos, hoy día hay solamente dos cosas que nos conectan a las más de 100 personas que están en esta sala, y es la crisis que estamos viviendo en materia sanitaria, ambiental y social, y también, lo segundo y más importante aún, nuestro más profundo interés en que esta crisis se resuelva, y para ello tenemos que empoderar a otras personas dando más herramientas para que puedan hacer valer sus derechos. Muchas, muchas gracias. Hola, ¿cómo están? Bueno, yo soy Nikki, Nikki Becker, soy activista por la justicia climática de Argentina y también champion de Escazú como Seba. Voy a tratar de hablar despacio, me cuesta, pero lo vamos a intentar, así todo el mundo puede entender la, la traducción. Y me parece clave un poco esto que decía ah, Seba de, del derecho a la información. Tienes... Uh, uh, one moment, Venus, uh, you're not in the Chinese channel. Thank you, sorry, there was an interpretation. Okay. okay. Can, can I... Okay. Bueno, sí, en español. Ok, ok. Eh, un poco esto que decía Seba del derecho a la información, que es algo tan clave porque si ni siquiera entendemos lo que está pasando en el presente, menos vamos a poder cambiar el futuro. Y algo que a mí me sorprende mucho, y de hecho fue parte por lo que yo me convertí en, en activista climática, que no es una decisión. Para la mayoría de los activistas climáticos y ambientales que yo conozco, juveniles, no es que un día se levantaron preocupados por la crisis climática y decidieron empezar a hacer algo, sino que es algo que no nos queda opción. Cuando nos imaginamos el futuro que vamos a heredar, pero del cual no decidimos nada, nos da miedo. Nos da miedo y ese miedo lo tenemos que traducir en acciones concretas, entendiéndonos como parte de un colectivo mucho más grande. Eh, y, y algo que a mí me sorprendió mucho en febrero de 2019, cuando me empecé a involucrar en estos temas, es que sabemos de la crisis climática hace más de 40 años. 40 años, yo tengo 20 años. Eso significa que sabemos de la crisis climática cuando a mí yo todavía iba recién a nacer en 20 años. Y todo daría a que si sabemos de la crisis climática hace 40 años, se deberían haber tomado todas las medidas necesarias para que no enfrentemos esta crisis. Sin embargo, todo lo contrario, en los últimos 40 años emitimos más gases de efecto invernadero, que son estos gases contaminantes, que en toda la historia de la humanidad. Y esto es desde, o sea, un poco para, para entender también con los tiempos, y, y desde la juventud entendemos que los cambios que se necesitan para frenar la crisis climática son difíciles, y son complejos, y son muy estructurales también, y para que sean realmente justos van a llevar tiempo. 
pero no puede ser que ya hayamos esperado 40 años y nada haya pasado, o sí, pero muy poco, al menos. Y eso es un poco también que, lo, cómo se relaciona con el Acuerdo de Escazú, porque muchas veces la información que tenemos, primero se oculta, se oculta porque no conviene que sepamos la información, porque es un poco lo que hablaba Seba antes, ¿no? Si tenemos información, si entendemos lo que está pasando, yo estoy segura que vamos a hacer lo imposible para frenar esto, porque no creo que seamos malos como humanidad, creo que todavía no hacemos el clic de que en realidad hablar de crisis climática es hablar de una cuestión de derechos humanos, y de hecho, algo muy interesante es que si hoy en día uno busca en Google crisis climática o cambio climático, te aparece un oso polar. Todas las fotos que aparecen son de un oso polar. Que es verdad, el oso polar está en peligro de extinción. Pero yo personalmente, y con la mayoría de los activistas que conozco, no luchamos por un oso polar. Estamos luchando porque hay gente que está padeciendo las consecuencias de la crisis climática hoy, no mañana. Ni siquiera estamos luchando solamente porque nos da miedo a nuestro futuro sino porque hoy en día, por ejemplo, en Argentina se encendieron más de un millón de hectáreas, y en otros países es muchísimo, pero muchísimo peor. Entonces, si no entendemos que no hay justicia social sin justicia eh, ambiental, y viceversa, que tampoco hay justicia ambiental sin justicia racial, sin justicia de género, eh, la palabra justicia, que es algo que está presente mucho en el Acuerdo de Escazú, tanto por el acceso a la justicia, pero para, también para entender eh, la justicia como algo más amplio, es algo central, porque al fin y al cabo las injusticias son el corazón de la crisis climática. Es por lo que la crisis climática, en primer lugar, suce sucedió, o sea, por lo que, porque la, lo que produce la crisis climática, pero también porque es la única forma de solucionarla, me parece. Eh, estos dos conceptos son algo para mí que tiene que ver con la justicia ambiental, la justicia climática es eh, una perspectiva fundamental para entender, bueno, por qué la juventud... Eh, está tan eh, activa y tan despierta con estos temas, sobre todo desde el 2019, ¿no? y que fue un poco, si bien la juventud me parece que a lo largo de toda la historia siempre estuvo al frente de las transformaciones sociales, y estuvimos dispuestos a dar nuestro cuerpo, nuestro tiempo, eh, a también escribir la historia con nuestras propias palabras, crear, hablar, alzar nuestra voz, eh, los ejemplos me parece que sobran, desde el mayo francés, o sea, creo que hay muchísimos, y hoy en día uno de los temas que tanto nos está interpelando tiene que ver con la lucha por la justicia eh, climática, ¿no? Y también hay que entender que, que no todas las juventudes tienen las mismas oportunidades. Yo, en donde vivo, tengo la oportunidad de luchar por la justicia climática sin tener miedo de lo que me pase. Tengo ese privilegio que es muy grande, porque en otros lados, mismo mi propio país, ni siquiera, por ejemplo, esto pasa en Colombia, bueno, Latinoamérica, y que es algo que la Acuerdo Escazú habla, es la región más peligrosa para ser defensor o defensora ambiental. Eso es terrible, hay gente que ni siquiera puede hacer esto tranquilo de que a la noche va a poder dormirse eh, sin tener una amenaza. Y eso también hay que ponerlo sobre la mesa. Y también me parece algo eh, súper lindo estar acá hoy hablando con Seba, porque en general en los paneles que van a escuchar a jóvenes hablar de crisis climática son jóvenes de Europa, por ejemplo, ¿no? jóvenes del norte global. Es difícil encontrar a gente del sur global eh, en paneles hablando de crisis climática, cuando en realidad es paradójico, porque quienes más sufrimos los impactos de la crisis climática somos los países del sur global, ¿no? las comunidades más impactadas. Eh, y algo muy curioso, que justo lo hablaba ayer, es que, por ejemplo, el derecho al agua y saneamiento no estuvo por mucho tiempo en la Declaración de Derechos Humanos, porque los países que tenían escasez de agua no estaban presentes cuando se hizo esa declaración. Entonces ahí vemos la importancia de la representación, ¿no? de estar en esos espacios, de poder dar eh, la batalla y de poder contar como nuestra propia historia. Creo que, y para ir cerrando, la crisis climática en algún punto es la historia que no sabemos contar. ¿No? A veces cuando hablamos de crisis climática, eso, o hablamos de un oso polar, o hablamos de algo muy complejo, de números, de estadísticas, 1.5, cosas que parecen muy lejanas a nuestra cotidianidad. Cuando en realidad la crisis climática tiene que ver con historias de gente, con historias no solo de gente impactada por la crisis climática, sino también de gente que ya está cambiando las cosas. Es la historia de... Seba y cómo creó su movimiento en Chile, es también mi historia de cómo acá en Argentina el movimiento climático ahora es re grande, gracias al eh, conjunto de historias de muchas personas que se unieron para crear una historia sola, distinta. No es, es un poco el, el conjunto de historias que se unieron para crear una historia que, que realmente sea distinta, porque al fin y al cabo nuestra visión del futuro también está en crisis, porque nos cuesta un poco pensar en eso. 
Eh, bueno, creo que, que ahora sí para ir cerrando y no, no sacar más tiempo, un mensaje que para mí es muy clave y que creo que el, el activismo nos lo enseña día a día, es que la salida a la crisis climática y la única forma de solucionar la crisis climática es de una forma colectiva, es uniéndonos, es teniendo una misma visión del futuro que tenemos y también de pasar de, esa, de esas palabras a acciones reales. Y los necesitamos absolutamente a todos en esta lucha. Eh, si sos escritor, si sos cantante, si sos abogado, si sos cualquier cosa, absolutamente cualquier cosa que hagas, te necesitamos. Así que eh, unite a, a la lucha por la crisis climática y nos veremos pronto, ojalá en otro panel, o en, otra, en las calles, o en donde sea, que seguro espacios sobran. Thank you so much. Um, it's really great to hear testimony from uh, activists who are uh, involved in the, the process. Um, it's so important that we tell the stories of why knowledge and information, why understanding of the right to the environment is important for uh, the, these spaces. I also want to um, thank Andy for interpreting. Um, I know it's very hard to be both a live interpreter and uh, someone supporting uh, other interpreters. Uh, this is a, a, it's a challenging task. Um, and I, I really want to uh, uh, commend that um, and all the other interpreters uh, as well. Um, next, I want to briefly uh, talk about what we, we mean by the uh, Wiki for Human Rights campaign and why um, it's so important that you participate. So I'm going to briefly show some slides um, and let me um, share. Um, where, why did it screen share? Okay, um, interesting. Okay, um, I'm going to do a, the screen share did not work the way that it worked last time. So I will do that. Um, so, uh, share. Um, so how, how do we uh, want you to participate? Are, are the slides good, by the way? Yep, we can see it. That's good. Um, so how, what, what is Wiki for Human Rights and how to get involved? Um, so Wikipedia is a really important public platform uh, and we've designed a, um, uh, a call to action and a series of steps for you to learn how to contribute uh, to that public platform to share and knowledge. Um, uh, we have a landing page uh, for this campaign. Uh, for Wiki for Human Rights, the right to a healthy environment, and you can find a link at the bottom. Um, as many of you may know, Wikipedia is an encyclopedia. It's a summary of expert opinions, expert ideas, facts, knowledge created by communities around the world. And those, uh, those facts and knowledge are recorded on uh, 200 uh, languages, or th over 300 languages. Um, by volunteer communities. And we need your help to cover issues related to uh, uh, human rights, the healthy environment, and the environmental crises more generally. Um, if you want to join us, we have the short link, uh, w.wiki uh, uh, slash DGL, which you can use to access the, the campaign page. Um, what do we mean by contributing to Wikipedia? Well, there's basically four steps to contributing to a campaign. Um, you can sign into your Wikipedia account. Uh, and if you don't have one, it's easy to create and free. Um, you can read the documentation or attend a community event to learn how to edit and participate in the campaign. Um, and then you write about one of the topics or actions that we have recommended for everyone. Um, if you are experienced in research or writing, this should be a fun and interesting task. Um, if you are a communicator, we, we hope you get a chance. Um, and then we, when you save these edits, you simply use our hashtag um, for the campaign. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I'll show you how to do that. We want you um, to join us on 
editing Wikipedia, or writing about topics like environmental defenders, uh, like folks like Nikki and Sebastian, who have been uh, active champions of, of this work around the world. Legal systems or treaties, like what David and uh, the UN Human Rights Team are advocating for. Uh, communities advocating for their rights. So if a community is in uh, a, a protest or uh, is uh, actively asking for support in the global community, um, that let those communities document those communities. And also the consequences uh, of not having a healthy environment. What, what happens to communities when something like a mine uh, interferes with access to health? Um, uh, an example of this, uh, so I was looking for examples of the kinds of edits that are powerful for, for Wikipedia communities. Um, so a Columbia and uh, a mine, open coal mine in Colombia called uh, Cerajon, uh, is uh, actively causing health issues and damaging land around it. Um, and uh, this was documented. Uh, that the the community around uh, was asking for UN help to do this, and by some the another editor came along about a month ago, and said that um, several independent U UN human rights experts uh, uh, described the mining operations, asked for the mining operations to be halted, citing the environmental and health impacts on the indigenous communities. Um, just adding that one sentence, like the world has changed, pay attention. Uh, that this is a human rights issue is really powerful because that article about Sarah Hung, um, the next time someone searches for it in English, sees information about that coal mine uh, uh, out there in the news, they also learn about that connection with human rights, with the environment. And we have uh, lots of kind of actions in the campaign page uh, that can help you uh, find these, these gaps find these opportunities, add a citation to a reliable source describing this exact thing. One thing to note about Wikipedia, Wikipedia is not built on people's opinions, but rather on facts and documentation. Um, and so uh, we really need these citations uh, describing where and what actions these are. Also, when you go to save such a change to Wikipedia, as anyone can edit, when you click save, make sure you add the hashtag wiki for human rights. Now, this doing this by yourself, uh, learning from written documentation might be intimidating. Uh, we have uh, a number of events on the campaign page uh, that you can join that are around the world. They don't cover all 300 languages or, and all the geographies, but there are many opportunities. Um, there's over 20 activities uh, where you can connect with one of our local Wikimedia communities to learn more about how to contribute and to get support. Um, we also have a few trainings tomorrow for those of you attending uh, this event or are interested in uh, that are seeing the communication about the campaign. Um, if you want to learn how to edit, we have some hands-on support. Um, we don't have newcomer trainings for all languages and all geographies uh, this round um, because of how complicated that is. Each Wikipedia and e each Wikipedia community has a different kind of editorial practice, and we want to really support the local communities uh, supporting you learning how to edit. Um, if you're a, a Wikipedia, uh, we also have a challenge where, uh, and with some small prizes and certificates, uh, that if you want to come write new content uh, based off a list that UN Human Rights has provided, um, we we have that. Um, now we are at the time, uh, so I want to say you can edit. Um, this is entirely uh, your opportunity. Um, so despite the technical difficulties. And I really want to apologize for that. Um, we uh, translation plus uh, the coordination across many time zones and around the world uh, is complicated. Um, we wanted to give some space for both conversation between the panelists, um, if they have questions of each other, or uh, questions from the audience. So, um, Deb, uh, what, do we have a couple of questions that you think are ready? 
for um yes there's a couple of questions um some of them dealt with basically how are we going to take what we've learned um, as far as awareness with COVID-19 and the global pandemic and how can we then make it possible to use some of that awareness um, with those practices of good health as a, as it pertains to um, our talk today and it was open to anyone to answer go ahead Nikki. Okay, um, I was speaking in Spanish too. Uh, creo que la pandemia nos dejó el, una enseñanza muy clara que es que no podemos volver a hacer las cosas igual que como las estábamos haciendo antes, ¿no? O sea, y que es un poco el desafío que nos pone la crisis climática, que es realmente salir de la caja y poder imaginarnos un, un presente también y un futuro que sea realmente distinto. Tenemos que aprender a producir de una forma distinta, consumir de una forma distinta, pero también a relacionarnos entre nosotros mismos y también con la naturaleza de una forma distinta. Me parece que de la pandemia no podemos salir iguales, sería como una, una gran decepción, también porque, y creo que lo decía Seba antes, que la pandemia al fin y al cabo es causada por la destrucción de ecosistemas, y como juventud no queremos un futuro en donde la pandemia sea algo cotidiano, y, y estoy segura que nadie quiere eso, porque nadie la está pasando bien ahora con, con esta situación, y también las injusticias mismo también con las vacunas, ¿no? que por ejemplo, hay países donde gente de mi edad ya se vacunó, y acá ni siquiera mi abuela se vacunó en Argentina, y Argentina no es el peor país con respecto a las vacunas, entonces eh, creo que también las desigualdades se ponen sobre la mesa, eh, cuando hablamos de, de la pandemia y espero que podamos aprender algo y sobre todo eso, animarnos a pensar una, un futuro que sea realmente muy distinto pero que a su vez eso implique que también sea mejor y sea más justo If I could just chip in, I, I agree totally with what Nikki said, she's obviously super eloquent and well informed about these issues but I would also just add that you know, from my perspective, of course, this pandemic has been terrible. It has really exposed the injustice of the world. It's caused so much suffering and grief, but it has also shown us that we can respond with incredible quickness when we put our minds to it. I mean, the fact that scientists were able to develop these vaccines so quickly in, in the face of a global public health emergency, you know, we've known about the climate problem since the early 1990s. So for 30 years, we've just been kind of dragging our heels. And what COVID-19 shows us is that we, if we actually put our minds to it, if we make a concerted effort, we can change things very quickly. We can change behavior, we can change rules, we can invest literally hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars in solving a problem. And we need to do that with the climate crisis the way we've done that with the COVID-19 crisis. Okay, just to add to what um, David said, I, I mean, the pandemic has also taught us how to um, distinguish between misinformation and um, uh, fake news that circulates with regards to um, the wrong, you know, um, updates of cases that have been happening, especially in Ghana. Most of that has happened. And um, thankfully, people resorted to Wikipedia to get their hands first, you know, information, factual information, because they trust Wikipedia in that setting. So that's a little bit I want to add to it. Too. Yeah, and, and I think this move to turn to places where, where we can collect and aggregate information rather than just um, like the news or the thing that is circulating on WhatsApp um, has been like a really important part of how we think about uh, like information and knowledge, right? Uh, Wikipedia is ultimately a, a project in public communication. Um, and I think the pandemic has really made us think like, what can we do to circulate uh, uh, knowledge better as a platform like Wikipedia? Um, and I'm wondering uh, to the panelists, uh, why like Wikipedia is a very big public platform in like 300 languages. Why is it important for like these multilingual kind of decentralized communication platforms to share the message that is like also shared by these UN treaty organizations or to highlight the human rights issues uh, important to uh, local communities. Uh, why do we need these like global platforms, multilingual platforms doing those too? 
And we have one more message if we have time. Um, it's also in the chat. So this was for um, uh, David. Um, basically, uh, it's, it's coming from Christian, um, who's a, a budding lawyer and wanting to know what kind of books should uh, they start watching and reading and, and what are the important cases um, and judgments that we should be following in the coming year. Okay, sure. Well, I'll jump in there on both those questions. In terms of Wikipedia, I mean, I think one of the critical things about Wikipedia is that, you know, for example, my reports to the United Nations are available in the six official languages of the UN. But as we know, there are thousands of languages that people use around the world. And so I think Wikipedia is one of the great attributes of Wikipedia is that information is available in hundreds of languages, which just spreads this critical information much more broadly. Um, in terms of books, you know, there's so many good books out there. I think there's, there's a lot of books about the problems, but I would really encourage people to look for books about the solution. So, you know, for example, I've got a book called The Optimistic Environmentalist, which is actually full of surprisingly encouraging stories about how the world is becoming a better place. Um, there are books by Paul Hawken. Uh, so look for books with hope in the title. There's a, there's a book actually by a, an American professor called, which is about hopefulness from human rights. There's a book called Humankind, Hope for, Hope, A Hopeful History uh, by Rutger Bregman. And those books are all really inspiring. And I think, you know, in face of the, the, the major challenges that we're confronting today, to have, uh, to have books that actually give you a sense of hope is critically important for people because we know we have massive problems that we're trying to solve. And, and to uh, Nikki and Sebastian and Joy, uh, what what about these multilingual international platforms are important? Sí, creo que Wikipedia, en general, las, las plataformas así que hablan, que pueden ser traducidas a muchos idiomas, y creo que Wikipedia tiene un rol central en, por un lado, democratizar la, la información en todo sentido, en cuanto a la accesibilidad de que se entienda, de que pueda ser escrita también por alguien como uno, eh, que le interesa un tema, pero con, con propiedad y con datos, como antes hablaba Alex. Eh, y a su vez que también pueda ser leída por muchas personas. De hecho, ahora hay una campaña muy interesante de UNICEF, Friday for Future, que es el movimiento global que, que soy parte, y Wikipedia, para hacer páginas a activistas del sur global, ¿no? que es esto un poco que hablábamos, de que muchas veces se conoce solo a, a activistas de, de Europa, cuando en realidad hay muchos activistas increíbles a lo largo de todo el mundo, eh, y estamos trabajando para que esas personas también tengan su propia página de Wikipedia eh, y puedan contar su propia historia. Eh, y eso me parece que es uno de los tantos ejemplos de un millón de cosas que podemos hacer en conjunto eh, para justamente amplificar las voces de, de activistas y también en general esparcir eh, información sobre, sobre esta temática. Yo me sumo a, a lo que han dicho recientemente David, Nikki. Eh, creo que es momento también oportuno para valorar el tremendo trabajo que ha estado haciendo Wikipedia este último tiempo eh, y como bien decía Nikki, su rol en la democratización de información y también la velocidad en la que están reaccionando. Yo, bueno, soy de Chile, un país que tuvo un estallido social en 2019 muy, muy importante en un momento en que cuando fue el eh, estallido, por así decirlo, nadie sabía muy bien lo que estaba pasando. Y si no me equivoco, dos días después ya había una página de Wikipedia explicando lo que pasaba. Entonces realmente creo que han tenido una respuesta muy muy rápida, que da mucha tranquilidad y confianza en tiempos de incertidumbre, donde nadie sabe muy bien lo que está pasando en el mundo, eh, y creo que ahí el rol que están cumpliendo es fundamental, y claro, siempre se puede profundizar eh, y seguir mejorando aún más. Okay, um, just to add to what all the panelists have said, have shared, um, I want to also highlight on the gaps that exist. Um, I mean, it's important for us to also utilize that platform because if it's a repository that um, houses the sum of all knowledge, then we need to um, go all in to ensure that there's the gaps that exist has to be um, bridged. So when I talk about the, the main challenge of being the gaps is because um, information coverage, um, gaps on information coverage is still, still exist. And these gaps, you know, is rather scanty, it's inadequate, or 
it doesn't even exist at all. So um, I would give an example of uh, the continent I am in. So in Africa, um, we have we've also faced a lot of challenges with regards to these topics, not just on human rights, but then on environment and diverse topics. We realize that um, having few um, um, journalists or writers publishing um, um, few relevant information, which is actually crippling us to, you know, go on and to create small articles that need to be represented on Wikipedia. So I, I use this opportunity to encourage all Africans and those in the diaspora to um, take up this opportunity and ensure that um, there's proper representation on Wikipedia. Like I was saying earlier on, we can collaborate with the media institutions, um, researchers, they don't know about this. They don't know about how they can contribute. Some people still feel like Wikipedia is an alien and there are some, um, probably is a bot or something that improves or edits articles on Wikipedia, but they are humans and it relies on all of us to support. So yeah, I'm for bridging the gap. And in a related question, um, I, I, a lot of my coverage of human rights and environmental issues, it relies on expert communities or journalists seeing these issues and documenting them. I'm wondering, uh, especially in light of the Eskazu Agreement, which um, if those of you who are not familiar with it, the agreement is designed for Latin American uh, countries to uh, require governments to be better at disclosing uh, human rights and environmental issues, uh, information about human rights and environmental issues. Um, I'm wondering like what institutions are, are needed, what kinds of documenters or experts or journalists are needed for us to see the overlapping issues of environment and human rights? Um, where are we not covering? Uh, this information what's not being documented and why so I, that's a complex question but like what what's missing in the the communication environment for this eh, muy, creo que es una pregunta muy buena y, y completa o sea digamos creo que nadie tiene una una respuesta así concreta pero creo que el conjunto de lo que podamos responder puede servir para para crear una interesante eh, para mí, ¿qué está faltando? Está faltando ponerle una cara al problema. Es, eh, para mí, digamos, está comprobado de, a, a nivel de la neurociencia de que uno no decide a partir de algo racional nada más, sino también desde algo emocional, que te interpele desde lo emocional. Entonces, muchas veces me parece que hablar de solamente de estadísticas, solamente de datos científicos, que son muy importantes, pero que no solamente eso te va a hacer cambiar de opinión. Me parece que lo que te cambia de opinión es contar la historia de, eh, no sé, eh, Sebastián, y que a partir de contarte la historia de Sebastián, te diga que como Sebastián hay dos millones de personas. Pero si yo solo te digo que hay dos millones de personas, es algo muy lejano de comprender y a veces cuesta mucho. Entonces creo que lo que más cuesta es contar esas historias, y a veces cuesta contar estas historias porque cuesta verlas. no o sea Uno no se preocupa por lo que no ve, eh, y muchas veces, si bien eh, los problemas ambientales están en lo que respiramos, en lo que comemos, en absolutamente todas las decisiones que tomamos, creo que a veces eh, se las sigue viendo como algo muy lejano, tanto en tiempo como en espacio. Es algo, un poco lo que decía antes, que afecta al oso polar y que nos va a afectar a nosotros recién en, no sé, 300 años. Eh, y es un poco el desafío que tenemos dentro de la comunicación de la crisis climática. Creo que definitivamente la la crisis climática es un problema de comunicación, de cómo la comunicamos, y es algo que para mí nos la tenemos que replantar día a día. Yo en mi caso estoy muy, muy de acuerdo con todo lo que dice Nikki. Creo que si bien Wikipedia tiene esa impronta de ser una página muy informativa, que tiene mucha información de datos duros, por así decirlo, de lo que está pasando, a veces falta también explicar un poco cómo es que llegamos a eh, ciertas cosas. Me explico un poco la idea. Cuando hablamos del Acuerdo de Escazú, no hablamos tan solo de un tratado regionalmente vinculante que involucra ciertos estados y que tiene tales determinaciones después en la práctica en términos jurídicos, sino que hablamos de un acuerdo que es resultado de un problema. Y ese problema parece que nunca lo contamos. No contamos, por ejemplo, la cantidad de defensores ambientales que están siendo amenazados, que están siendo perseguidos, la cantidad de proyectos ambientales contaminantes que están en crecimiento y esa parte de la historia que 
como bien decía Niki, también es la parte más importante, porque es el lado humano de lo que está pasando, eh, nos puede ayudar también a involucrarnos un poco más y entender por qué un acuerdo como el de Escazú puede ser también más relevante. Eh, y ahí también cobra mucho sentido lo, lo mismo que decía Niki, de contar historias. Eh, no la historia, y, y vuelvo a recalcar el punto, no la historia de cuándo se aprobó tal resolución eh, en la Asamblea General que dio pie a tal cosa, que es una historia muy importante que hay que contar, pero además hay otras historias eh, más ocultas, más silenciosas, más secretas, de personas que están detrás de estas demandas, que están levantándolas y que están viviendo en carne propia los efectos, por ejemplo, de la crisis climática o que están realmente siendo perseguidas y que pueden aportar muchísimo más eh, una visión distinta de por qué un acuerdo como el de Escazú es súper importante. Y por último, la misma dirección, que creo que es un tema muy importante, el de las amenazas, el hostigamiento. Eh, también Wikipedia podría ser eh, una plataforma útil donde personas puedan contar de manera tal vez un poco más anónima eh, problemas ambientales, desastres ambientales, problemas de industria que eh, hoy día están operando y que justamente están hostigando a los periodistas, a los investigadores para que no levanten más información al respecto. Creo que Wikipedia se da también para dar un, un espacio seguro donde las personas puedan comunicar lo que está pasando sin ser víctimas de amenaza ni hostigamiento. Yeah, I'll add to that uh, what Sebastian and Nikki have said. I'm currently working on a report for the United Nations about what I call sacrifice zones. These are areas where profits are being put ahead of people and where public interests are being subjugated to private interests. And a sacrifice zone is a place where there's just absolutely terrible pollution. So these are, you know, communities that are living next door to oil refineries or chemical factories or other industrial facilities. They are These are, the, these are the invisible faces of today's industrial economies, right? So we all use oil and gas in one way or another for transportation. But there are certain human populations in almost every country in the world that are really bearing the brunt of that. They're always poor communities. They're often black and indigenous communities. And I think it's absolutely critical that we shine a light on these situations and that we take steps to protect the right to a healthy environment of the people who today, in today's world, are currently suffering the greatest impacts of pollution and environmental degradation. And, and so that's, you know, that's kind of a dark side. Those are, those are disturbing stories. On the flip side, uh, I produced a report last year for the Human Rights Council that highlighted over 500 good practices from over 150 countries where governments, businesses, communities, civil society organizations are actually doing things right. And I think it's equally important that we profile those stories as well so that we have the understanding that there are terrible situations out there, terrible injustices, rights being violated, but we know what the solutions are. And we know that we can, we can solve these problems if we have the political will. And sometimes it takes a lot of activism and a lot of effort to generate that political will. And it's not, it's not easy, it's not quick, but the human right to a healthy environment is a powerful tool in pushing governments and pushing businesses to do the right thing. Okay, I think I'll hit on what uh, Nikki also shared about the communication and also telling the stories. So when it comes to um, the human rights, I know that for Uh, my part of the world, we, 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 we are more like looking out for um, assessing whether the environment is healthy or unhealthy, be it uh, physically, be it, um, in, be, it, be it being documented, or um, how institutions or the constitution or the rule of law has been presented online, because sometimes you don't have access to that information. A typical example is a fact-checking institution that Um, 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 and parts of where we started sharing facts on the constitution of Ghana. And anytime we share, we get feedback as though like people are surprised this is some of the information in the book. So it, it, it dawned on us and we're like, okay, so once we're making this available online, why don't we try as much as possible to improve the content on the constitution on Wikipedia? This is also related to the human rights. Do, does everybody know their human rights? In the, locality they are in, um, how has the impact of the environmental issues, what, what, has the, what has environmental issues impacted 
in your like what, what has been the impact in your community sorry so with that with these questions it, it tells you that there's a lot that people may not know this is where we have to utilize this platform to collate all the information that we need and make sure that everyone has access to it sorry there's and, no mess in my background <laughs> yeah thanks troy and i i think too like what i've heard talking from uh activists like yourself and from uh, uh other youth activists that i've talked to in uh, the west african context there's also a gap in like journalists covering the topics like that there are not enough people documenting deforestation there's not enough people like telling that story in any public setting. Um, uh, do you want to speak to that at all? Yes, um, that, that is true. Um, there are not a lot of people covering these topics and um, it's because, I mean, our population, we are not so much, but then we are a lot. And the challenge here is, <clears throat> I think, uh, the, our focus is mostly on uh, certain projects, specific projects that we usually want to um, um, run. But then when it comes to such sensitive topics or important topics that really impacts the society and the environments that we live in, I think it's, it's best for us to also approach these institutions. I recall the Wiki for Climate um, event that we organized last year in Ghana, where uh, we encountered a lot of activists, researchers, and journalists who were very enthusiastic about the, the call that we made. And they were, you know, although it was a very short notice or short period, we were able to have a lot of them contribute to the platform. Some will send you photos of areas or landscape that have been degraded. And we were actually clueless. We didn't know about it because these information are not covered online they're not really putting out stories out there for us to grasp and then um, and share that you know, or preserve that information on wikipedia so i think it's important for us to um, delve or divert a bit and get these institutions on board get these activists on board because there are a lot of activists and once it's something that is in their focus area they will be willing to support and also improve upon um, Wikipedia. And like I was saying, people still believe that Wikipedia is an alien institution where um, information just comes abruptly, but then they don't know that there are humans behind it, putting all efforts to ensure there's proper representation or documentation. So we need to keep pushing, keep like more communication and ensuring that the target audience that we have are unique. Um, so I, we're, we're nearing uh, kind of the amount of time uh, we had for Q&A, um, but I've seen several questions about like risks or concerns or um, challenges uh, that are faced in like communicating uh, about environment or human rights on the ground. Um, and I'm wondering if each panelist uh, maybe wants to take like a minute or two just to talk about like what uh, what kind of concerns or, or questions do you have uh, when, uh, or where does communicating uh, human rights and environmental issues intersect with risk? Uh, and what are you observing? Um, uh, for right now, I, I, I don't think we can go into like full solutions, but just uh, are you noticing that like human rights and environmental issues are creating risks uh, for the communities who, who want to see these stories told? And just to expand real quickly on that, some of the questions that we've been seeing is basically um, what kind of dangers and risks do you have when you go on Wikipedia and you make those edits on, on climate change um, and environmental um, you know, crime reporting and such like that. So some of those types of risks of being, of being an activist in your own country, um, but you might be yet you know, as an opponent to somebody else. And this doesn't have to be about uh, anything directly affecting you? Um, just are, are you noticing anything um, that we should be paying attention to as Wikipedia editors um, for uh, w when thinking about these issues? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a really important issue. There are definitely some countries in the world that are hotspots of violence, intimidation, harassment, even criminalization 
of people working to protect the environment, to protect human rights. And so, you know, people, we have to make sure that we protect people in those countries. And I'm, I'm not sure if Wikipedia has tools to protect the identity of its editors, but I think that would be one important step. And then, you know, making sure that those, those people are connected to communities so that they have a community and a network of people that they can reach out to if they're, if they're facing threats and violence. It's a, it's a major, major problem in places like Latin America, in the Philippines, other countries in Southeast Asia, that people, people put themselves at risk by, by doing advocacy on behalf of this beautiful planet that we all share. And so, um, you know, we need to do two things. We need to put in place laws and mechanisms to make sure that um, we protect those individuals. We should be treating them as, as heroes and not criminals or terrorists. But we also have to do a better job of preventing those kinds of conflicts in the first place. And that goes back to, you know, what several of the panelists have talked about, you know, transforming society in ways that make, make our economic system much more sustainable, much more respectful of human rights. And until we prevent these kinds of problems, we're going to be continually putting band-aids on at the other end of the, at the other end of the problem. Do any of the other panelists want to speak to that? You don't have to. Yo me sumo a lo que acaba de comentar David. Yo creo que hoy día en la cantidad de amenazas a defensores ambientales, y no tan solo a quienes están en la primera línea luchando contra una central, por ejemplo, contaminante o contra una industria, sino que todas las personas que están involucradas en las temáticas ambientales. Me refiero a periodistas, investigadores, escritores, eh, personas que levantan información en general, están siendo víctimas de amenaza y hostigamiento y lamentablemente los informes parecen indicar que desde 2012 hasta ahora el número de activistas amenazados no ha hecho otra cosa que aumentar. Eh, y tenemos que enfrentar la situación eh, urgentemente y creo que um, hay un cambio muy importante que todos tenemos que hacer para poder dar el primer paso, que es justamente valorar el trabajo de quienes están hoy día en la primera línea de defensa por el medio ambiente y reconocerlos como actores válidos dentro del debate, dentro de la opinión pública, dentro de lo que están haciendo. Y ahí Wikipedia tiene también un, un rol fundamental en reconocer, por ejemplo, el trabajo de los defensores ambientales, de los comunicadores, y también, y vuelvo a, a, a hablar un poco de la, lo que comentaba Nicky antes, de involucrarlos, de hacerlos parte de la historia, de que efectivamente sus logros, por ejemplo, en las campañas ambientales que han llevado a cabo, sean reconocidos como tales y sean considerados. Yo, lamentablemente, en... Bueno, la, la Dioamérica es justamente la región más peligrosa del mundo para defender el medio ambiente eh, y mi país, que Chile, no está exento de ello. Y conozco muchos casos de defensores ambientales que han sido asesinados estos últimos tiempos, estos últimos cinco años, que muy tristemente son todos conocidos una vez son asesinados. O sea, nadie sabía eh, cuál era su trabajo, nadie sabía qué es lo que estaban haciendo, nadie sabía su lucha porque, bueno, en muchos casos, por ejemplo, están en comunidades rurales, no tienen acceso a medios de comunicación, no tienen acceso a internet, eh, y son invisibilizados. Y cuando son invisibilizados, hay muy poco que se puede hacer para protegerlos. Nadie los conoce y nadie está preocupado de ellos. En cambio, si podemos levantar sus voces, hacer que se les escuche, eh, reconocer su trabajo, hay más probabilidades de que podamos protegerlos en caso de que sean amenazados. Sí, y... Coincido plenamente, me parece que, que ya lo dijeron todo, solamente agregar que, que también hay, o sea, hay que entender el por qué, el origen también, por qué esas personas están siendo amenazadas, que tiene que ver con que la crisis climática, la lucha por, la, por en general por la justicia ambiental es enfrentarse a muchos intereses y a muchos poderes muy grandes, y es también una lucha de... de eh, la lucha por la igualdad necesariamente implica que... que que traiga estas consecuencias, o sea, no necesariamente, pero me refiero a que te estás enfrentando a grandes poderes eh, económicos muy grandes que tienen que cambiar. O sea, el, tenemos que cambiar de combustible fósil a algo que no sea combustible fósil. Y eso es enfrentarse a todas las petroleras. Y enfrentarse a todas las petroleras eh, no tiene por qué implicar que estemos poniendo nuestra vida, porque lo único que estamos pidiendo no es algo muy exigente, sino es simplemente tener un planeta en donde poder habitar. Eh, y es desde el amor, no es desde, desde la furia, ¿no? no es desde el odio, sino desde el amor, desde amar la vida, amar a quienes nos rodean y querer poder seguir viviendo en este planeta. Eh, me parece que también es importante entender de dónde viene eso y también eh, hacernos cargo. Digo, el, el 1% de, 
de la población más rica emitió el doble que todo el 50% de la población más pobre. Es injusto eso. Y eso está sobre la mesa y eso también se ve en eh, estas cosas que estaban comentando. Solo eso para agregar. Unless there are other comments on this, I think we're right about at time. Um, so I want to thank the panelists so much uh, and all of the participants. Um, and we are uh, I, in my uh, kind of um, reaction to the technical difficulties at the beginning. I wasn't very grateful in saying that this campaign and this panel were really helped uh, put together by the UN Environmental Program, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, and we are also getting a little bit of support from the UNICEF uh, group that Nikki mentioned uh, earlier in the panel uh, to identify youth activists that, that ought to be documented uh, in their advocacy uh, for defenders uh, throughout the world. Um, so I, I want to kind of applaud and thank you. Um, uh, apologies for anyone's questions or comments that were not responded to in the chat uh, or in the Q&A. Uh, of course, we're uh, towards the end of time. Um, I wanted to invite uh, Sue Young from the uh, UN Environmental Program uh, to kind of uh, respond or react uh, to the uh, conversation we had here. Uh, and, uh, and I hope that we see you all uh, participating throughout the, the rest of the campaign. Thank you. Hi, um, thanks, Alex, and thanks, uh, everyone. Uh, so my name is Sue Young Hwang. I'm from UNEP, um, and uh, I just want to thank everyone, uh, um, the Alex uh, from Wikipedia and the interpreters and those OECHR and the panelists and everybody who's uh, who's participated in today's meeting. Thank you so much for um, uh, for making this happen. Um, and this is a really great collective work. And I just have to mention like. Um, like panelists and uh, um, Monica and everyone mentioned in the beginning, but uh, the importance of the information. So like people say that information is power, but also it's an enabler. So that actually, like when you know your information, you can actually exercise your other rights. So like you having information, you can exercise your right, right to participation. And that's really a key also like in, in seeking justice in environmental matters. So what you're doing is such a key important thing that is really making sure that our environmental rights are um, are shared with everyone and the people can actually um, empower their empowered to exercise their rights and I cannot actually think of a better way of actually um, disseminating this information than Wikipedia well I shouldn't say this because we have a lot of great reports at UNEP and at the UN uh, at the, the UN and David has done a lot of great reports but having said this I think like what I do for instance also I google you know when I want to know something I google and I end up in uh, Wikipedia so like uh, for like a uh, public and then for the normal people I think the Wikipedia is a really like the great entry point to get all the information that you want and with all your help coming from everywhere from the all corners of the world I think that makes a huge difference and that that will really empower people to know about uh, what's happening what's happening to environmental defenders or youth activists and uh, in the law and uh, in um, the institutions. So this is really, I can think of, um, this is such an exciting um, um, a project that, that UNEP is very happy to be part of. And I just wanna also mention about um, the information, like how a lot of times, oftentimes that we're in the receiving end to just getting the information, requesting information, but this is really like, you're actually, making sure that information is uh, created, well, not created, but information is built on the web page and, uh, and uh, through Wikipedia. So it's really um, the two ways of uh, doing um, an information. So like creating information, but also with um, the receiving information with disseminating information. So um, that's really um, a, a really great thing that we're doing uh, collectively and uh, coming together on this. And lastly, I just want to mention that David, uh, David and all the panelists, they mentioned about um, in, um, the right to health environment and other environmental issues. But uh, so the right to health environment is also in the building stage. 
because it's recognized by a lot of states at the national level and the regional level. But at the global level, we are building consensus on the, um, on the right to the environment. So I think this work, what we are doing is really going to push uh, our um, the efforts in building consensus on the right to the environment at the global level. So all this is to say that uh, we're very, very excited to be part of this uh, project and uh, we really appreciate everyone who's been part of this. And um, just wanna thank you. And uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll keep um, our um, collective efforts together. Thank you. And thank you so much, everyone. Um, and we are uh, gonna wrap up. If you are interested in um, uh, joining the, uh, the campaign. Uh, we have uh, uh, workshops and events throughout the Wikimedia communities and we invite you to join that. Um, otherwise, thank you and have a wonderful uh, Earth Week and Earth Month. Goodbye. Bye.